Hey, hello, Cherie here, the host and producer of Women's Running Stories. And before we get going, I just want to acknowledge that women need pockets, especially us women who run. And that is exactly why Wazelle designed the pocket jogger tights and shorts. They have seven pockets total, including a rear zip pocket, two large side pockets, and mesh pockets at the waist, so you can bring everything you need with you on every run. The fabric is soft and compressive enough, but not too compressive. And like all Wazelle products, they just look nice. And these pieces last forever. And I know firsthand because I have several pairs of the shorts and I have the tights in various lengths and they really are just fantastic. I even wear them out in my day-to-day life when I'm not running. So check out the Pocket Jogger tights and shorts at wazelle.com. That is O-I-S-E-L-L-E dot com. The apparel company created by women for women and rooted in running. Again, that's wazelle.com. You are listening to Women's Running Stories, and this is world record-setting sprinter turned ultra and marathon runner Kelly Bruno, who will be running in the professional para-athlete field at the Boston Marathon in April. Uh, Hi, my name is Kelly Bruno. I currently live in San Diego, but I'm transitioning to the Northeast, and um, I'm a pain physician by trade uh, and a runner by enjoyment. Yes, in this episode, you are going to hear from Kelly Bruno. And you will hear all about why being a runner for enjoyment these days is the culmination of a long journey. But before we hear more from Kelly, I want to welcome you to Women's Running Stories, the podcast where exceptional women runners share inspiring stories about their running experiences. I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am your host and producer, and this podcast is a proud member of the Evergreen Network of Podcasts. Now, one exciting announcement before we get into this episode is that I will be back co-hosting a panel once again at the Boston Marathon Expo on the live stage. And once again, I will be joined by my friends, Julie and Lisa, co-hosts of the Run Farther and Faster podcast. This panel will take place on Sunday, April 14th at 2 p.m. That is the day before the Boston Marathon. And I am very excited to share the athletes that will be on that panel. And they will be none other than, yes, Kelly Bruno. And she will be joined by Brianna Bomer and Ari Hendricks. And I have featured both of those athletes on the podcast as well. And I will link to those episodes in the show notes so you can get to know all of these athletes before you come see them live in conversation with myself and Julie and Lisa. Yeah, so come join us. It's going to be a great conversation. All right, now let's get into this episode. Kelly Bruno has been an athlete for her whole life. And because of a birth defect, she underwent a below-the-knee amputation on her right leg, so Kelly has always competed with a prosthetic, and she has competed at the highest levels of sport, pushing the limits in the world of para-athletics. She has raced in the sport of triathlon, and she has run in races from 100 meters to 100 miles. But a few years back, Kelly did begin to question her athletic motivations and wondered if pursuing athletic excellence in the ways that she had been was ultimately still something that was healthy for her. She's here to tell the whole story of her experiences becoming an athlete and then becoming a young world record-setting sprinter, her transition to endurance sports, and her recent journey back to running with a fresh new outlook and a big new PR as she gets ready to run her first Boston Marathon. Here to tell her story is Kelly Bruno. 
starting with what first drew her into the athletic life. Yeah, you know, I can think back to when I was, I mean, just little. Um, we were living in Germany at the time. My, my dad was in the Foreign Service, so we uh, we moved a lot when I was a kid. And I I was super active. I think there was a part of me, you know, I was born without the lower part of my right foot. And so getting into sports, I just it let me show that I you know, was capable and able and could keep up with everyone else. So I I remember I was playing T-ball actually um, and in the park. And, and that was kind of the first like experience where, you know, I, I was kind of in that athletic mindset. I just remember feeling like I needed, you know, to be perfect at this. And I just wanted to do the best job I could do. And and then get that feedback, right? The, of course, it's like your parents, you know, but the, you know, the crowd's out there and they're cheering for you. And that kind of environment was really encouraging to me. And so I found that throughout, you know, being an athlete, obviously, you know, running, especially long distances, there are many moments where you don't have anyone cheering for you. You're out there by yourself, you know. Um, but I think in the moments where, you know, you just have the support, it just is such a, it, it kind of brings it all home. It makes all that training worth it, right? And so I kind of had that. Kind of, the memory that I have of playing t-ball was kind of in that moment of like, you know, your parents cheering for you and that that feedback feeling so supportive. And, and I was like really little, not like I, mean, I was hitting a ball off a off a little tee, but it just it started that whole that whole journey. And then we actually moved back to the U.S. and I was in Virginia. And there was back then a clinic called the First Step Clinic, and it was hosted by some prosthetists and um, a couple of people from the U.S. disabled sports team. And I was 15, 14, 15 at the time, so still really young. And um, my dad really, I think, you know, for him, it was really hard seeing me go through what I went through as a kid. And so he really pushed me to do these things. And um, that was kind of the beginning of my running career. It was at the time I had this leg that was made of uh, like wood. Um, at, at least it seemed like it was made of wood. Um, it was very heavy. It was not um, an athletic leg at all. And so I, you know, learned the limitations. I mean, I didn't know anything better. It's all I had ever had. And so when I saw these running feet and just the um, advancements that had occurred in the, the carbon fiber feet, and I, I just was like enamored by all of the opportunities. And so, um, and, and it turned out I had a natural gift for running. And so after that clinic, I, I ran, I think the hundred meter and I did the long jump and I, did well enough to qualify for the the national team, um, even on a, a pretty a pretty a leg that just you know was not designed for athletics. And so from there, I was able to get into running and, and get a running leg and start to advance um, as as an athlete. And um, from there, I just I kind of took off. I, I raced on the USA Disabled Sports te- Sports Team for a couple of years, and then I started running track and field and cross country and I played basketball as a young athlete in high school and then um, got into triathlon and that was kind of the next phase of, of being an athlete. Um, I did triathlons for quite a few years and, and raced with the U.S. team in a number of different world championships and kind of evolved from there and then my next experience was an ultra runner and that was probably one of the most pivotal experiences kind of really establishing myself as most, mostly a runner. Cause I did that so often. Um, I was running, you know, a lot of hours a week and I just, I realized that was just for me, one of my favorite activities. I was in med school at the time. So it was just such a great kind of retreat from the day to day. And I recognized kind of the therapeutic value um, as well as, you know, being kind of enjoying the athletic experience. And uh, and I did my first 100 miler. And that was probably one of my most joyful moments was finishing uh, my first 100 and just realizing how how capable and and able-bodied I was despite my disability. 
Kelly has found great satisfaction in more recent times as an endurance and ultra athlete. But I do want to go back because from an early age, Kelly Bruno was an exceptional athlete and competitor, and being a competitive athlete played an important role at a critical time in her life. Yeah, so I mean, I was, oh gosh, I was so young back then. Um, thinking back, you know, I was, I mean, I started when I was 15, and thinking back, I, I mean, I guess I never really had the the frame to be a sprinter. I mean, I you know I have more of the distance body, uh, the distance running kind of I think slower twitch fibers and frame, but that was kind of what was popular and what I could do. And so, and and I have to say I do love it. I mean, I loved I love being back on the track. So I, I loved the workouts. Um, I would train either before school or after school um, when I wasn't or, you know, an all summer. And then I would go to these races and they, you know, they were around the world. I remember being in Barcelona and um, we were in England. Um, We would, I would basically show up and everyone else on the team was probably mid to late twenties and thirties. And then I was in my, you know, teenage years. So it was, I was kind of like the adopted, like sister, you know, younger sister of, of a lot of the athletes who, who took excellent care of me and and made sure, you know, I was uh, in the right place. And the racing was, you know, it was racing. It was, a, they were huge events, um, uh, world championships. Um, the, the International Paralympic Committee ran a lot of the races in the non-Paralympic years. I actually did um, go to the Paralympic trials. I had broken my wrist um, the week before. And so, I didn't qualify for Sydney, um, which was a huge disappointment. Um, one of those goals that, you know, has always kind of been in the back of my mind um, to, to kind of revisit going to the Paralympics. But yeah, I mean, that was, again, my kind of my, my real first feedback of that, of that cheering section, of that support, of just feeling like all the training I was doing was worth it, you know, winning a world, you know, or or setting a world record, winning races. It just, I don't know, it, it really was an early experience in, in success. And, and for me, I I think I just, I really needed that. You know, I I had a pretty big surgery when I was 12. So I had a, it's called a double osteotomy. So um, because of the birth defect I had, the way my lower limb formed, it started to curve. And it became more difficult to fit a prosthetic leg on and um, was quite painful. And so the surgeon went in and basically removed two wedges of bone to straighten the leg. And then that required an an external fixator, which is basically a metal device that is outside of the body to hold the leg straight for two months. So I had this pretty gnarly contraption on my leg which, you know, now I'd be like, oh, check this out. This is cool. But like when you're 12, it's like humiliating, right? And and they wanted me in a wheelchair because, you know, it was pretty strenuous. And of course, I, you know, was like, heck no. And so I was, you know, crutching around and, you know, trying to hide this. I felt very naked and, and vulnerable and exposed without my prosthesis on. And so it was pretty traumatic. And it really, I struggled a lot after that surgery to kind of come back from it. And, and I was pretty, you know, I would, I want to say depressed. I don't know if that's even the right term these days, but, you know, I just suffered from a lot of kind of self image issues. And so getting into that sprinting and getting into that racing life and that uh, those experiences really meant a lot to me and being able to kind of have that feedback and that, that success experience. I'm just having like the crowds, you know, like go wild. I mean, it's just, you can't really replicate that in any other way. I was what, 16, 17, probably when I set the world records. And um, I I guess I keep coming back to being so young um, and you don't know what you don't know. I mean, I think there was a part of me that just, that's, that's what you do, you know, like this was a little bit of uncharted territory in a way because we were starting to create new events and 
yes, the sprinting in the Paralympics and, and kind of track and field in the Paralympics has been around for a long time, but you know, it was really kind of a growing very quickly. And so I, I think I was there at a kind of the perfect time. Um, and it, it, a part of me just, I'm like, oh, this is what I'm training for. You know, this is kind of the natural course, even though obviously looking back and realizing that, you know, setting a world record is, is pretty unique and, and a huge athletic accomplishment. At the time, I'm just thinking like, this is, this is just the natural process. So I don't, I don't think it really sunk in. I, I just was luckily very talented at the time and in a very kind of niche event. And I mean, I really focused on the hundred and two hundred. And so just that was what I dedicated all my time to. Um, and I felt like the amount of time I put into it, it, that, that was kind of the expectation. I can't say, you know, I mean, I was super proud of myself. I was, I remember my parents, my dad, especially being exceptionally proud. And I was, you know, kind of just basking in this, in this moment. But at the same time, I, I don't think I appreciated how significant it was. Yeah. Um, when I finished high school and I went to college, I mean, I didn't have, you know, my parents there kind of looking over my shoulder. And so I started kind of exploring other sports and kind of what was easier to train for. And at the time, triathlon, the paratriathlon was becoming more popular. And for whatever reason, that just seemed like a little bit easier to maintain the travel for the USA disabled sports team was just so, so significant. And so as a, you know, trying to do that and maintain my studies was, was a little bit too much. And so it, it really was triathlon that I kind of got into and started getting me into more of that distance training. And I was just doing sprints in, in ITU distance. And then as my career progressed as a triathlete, and I kind of identified as a triathlete for a number of years, um, despite absolutely dreading the swim, I, for whatever reason, you know, that, that Iron Man just kind of like well, tantalized me. Um, I I just kind of hit the marks. Um, I did a number of, of IT World Triathlon Championships and, and they were amazing and incredible, but I just I kind of felt like, okay, I did it. And where am I going from here? And maybe that's how this journey has evolved is, you know, what what's next? And so at that point, I don't know. Iron Man just sounded like something that was just a new challenge. And I had a very, my, my now ex-husband, but he was very supportive. And so he, you know, really helped me to, to just go after that. And so I did my first Iron Man in 2007 and then did Kona uh, Iron Man World Championships in 2008. At that point, I was kind of like, okay, well, now I've basically done triathlon. I mean, of course I hadn't, but again, I'm in my 20s. So um, that's how I, I kind of approached it. And then when I started medical school, right around that same time, I started medical school in 2009. My, my life changed significantly and I went from working maybe like 30 hours a week to where I had the time to train for, you know, three disciplines at the, at the level that I needed to, to, to race an Ironman to literally having maybe 30 free hours in a week. And so I decided at that point I needed something a little bit easier. And, and I say that um, in a in tongue in cheek in a way because um, I picked ultras, but I think just having one discipline to train for, I felt like that would just be more manageable. And so, I my first marathon was actually in an Ironman, and then so I had done you know I do a quote unquote done a marathon. I'm like okay, well yeah, I could just why don't I just do a fifty? And so, but then in skipping the fifty, I went straight to a hundred because I go big or go home, and that was kind of that process. I mean, in each step, you know, it's, it's making that decision, that choice. I've always been one of those people that, that thinks big, I guess. This was my first hundred was the Umstead hundred in North Carolina. And I picked that one because it was literally in my backyard and I had some friends doing it. I, they had a 50 option and I figured worst case, if I couldn't make it to a hundred, I would just run the 50. You know, I would say, okay, like, like a 50 is still an enormous accomplishment and I would be really proud of myself. So if I went out with the intention of running the hundred, but all I could manage is a 50, 
then that I would be really happy with that. And so that's how I approached it. Of course, when I got actually got out there, I was like, there's no way in hell I'm only running a 50 unless they drag me off this course. But I guess that's the mindset of, of someone who maybe pushes themselves a little too much. Um, Kelly continued to push herself, running trail races and ultras. In all, she's run 300-mile events, including a return to Umstead. And that second time, she was going after the coveted belt buckle, and that is awarded to runners who finish under 24 hours. Kelly ran just under 23, and that bettered her previous time, which she had set just the year before, by roughly three and a half hours. But after several years of tackling the trails, Kelly did begin to question the role that running played in her life. It was definitely not something that I was um, anticipating or, or planning on. It was kind of a series of life um, life experiences, kind of life unfolding and um, really making me kind of step back and reflecting on what my relationship was to running and then figuring out kind of how to be a little, a little more healthy with it. And a lot of it started, I mean, I, I think mostly from kind of unfortunately, like many, many of us go through, um, kind of a, a little bit of a traumatic um, experiences that that really kind of forced it on me. Um, so I um, had just come out of, of pain fellowship. I was starting a new job. Um, and then unfortunately, my husband and I at the time um, had decided that, you know, they, we'd been together for 15 years and like since I'd been in college and, um, and you know, our relationship just wasn't working. So we um, became separated and then divorced. Um, and I still have a great relationship. He's actually my coach for Boston. So we still have a good relationship, but um, we just, you know, that was a huge major life change. Um, and then within like a month, COVID, you know, became the new thing. So I was actually training. I had just run Big Bear, um, was hoping to qualify for Boston at Big Bear in 2019 and um, missed the the qualifying time by like a few minutes. And um was ramping up for a, the next race for Ventura and um, then COVID hit. And so all the races were canceled. And so suddenly I had nothing to train for. And then throughout this, unfortunately, I was also going through um, a, some sexual harassment at work. And um, I think the like the combination of all those things, you know, now I had nothing to, to train for. I had nothing to kind of put me in that running, you know, get me out there running. And then um, and then all the trails were closed in California or in San Diego, at least. So I wasn't, I didn't have that outlet anymore, at least for a little while. And then I, you know, these huge kind of life things that I had to process. And so as I, and, and, and with that during COVID kind of that more insulated experience that we all had, you know, cause I just didn't have that support network that I felt like I had had because you know, we weren't, I didn't have the support at work where I, I had a lot of my friends. Um, I think for me, I just, it made me kind of step back from running, especially because I had nothing to train for. And I realized that when I wasn't training for something, I wasn't enjoying, I wasn't enjoying just going out and running. And so I actually, I stopped running for a while. You know, I'd maybe run like a couple miles, but, and I did a lot of like trail, but just very slow. I wasn't, there was no structure to it. And it started making me think about, okay, wh like, what is my relationship to running? Why am I pushing myself so hard? It, I really, and I really needed that break. I, I needed to work through a lot of, you know, these, these big life events. And I realized with running again, I couldn't, I wasn't necessarily processing the things. I think I was running away from them. I was filling up that time when I, I really should be focusing on, okay, you know, these life events have happened and I need to process them and I need to be okay with them and not just bury them, which is, you know, my, has been my, my method for 39 years. And so 
it took me like three years um, of that. And I, I just, it took me a long time to come back to running and say, I really enjoy this again. And in that time I did do some races and, and I enjoyed them. So it wasn't like I took a complete break, but it just, I didn't have like the structure training that I had been so used to for so many years. And, and when I stopped running, I, you know, everyone I'd meet, they're like, oh, you're a runner, aren't you? And um, I, it really was an identity for me. And then when I wasn't running, I'm like, oh, who am I? Like, and, and I realized like, I'm a doctor, I'm, I'm a lot of other things, but there was a part of me at that point where I, I really wanted to get to the point where I didn't need to identify with something. Like I'm just me, right? Like I don't need to be, I don't need to be a runner. I don't need to be a doctor. I don't need to be an athlete. I don't need to be an adaptive athlete. I, you know, I don't, I'm, I, I, I am all of these things, but I am also not any of these things because I think when you hold on to that identity so tightly, if you do lose it, it, it's, it kind of shatters you. And, and so until recently, I just had a hard time coming back to running without feeling attached to that identity. So balance has been one of the most important things. I, I mean, I look back and I realize how much I gave up as a younger athlete and, and I don't, you know, I, I, I don't want to tell especially younger athletes like, Hey, like, you know, give it up. Like, because I don't regret any of the relationship that I had with, with sports and, and athletics as a younger, you know, woman. But I realize I did give up a lot in like relationships, in friendships, in, you know, social time. I feel like I still achieved a lot. I mean, I, you know, I still went through med school and I still did and I did amazing things and, and I had some balance, but I think I did give up really important things like probably relationships being the biggest one, um, you know, relationships with a partner, relationships with friends and relationships with family. And those were the first things to go that, you know, to make time for the, the training and looking back and, and now that's like, I feel like I have much more balance in like doing both. Like in the past, so I, I just got back from a trip to New Zealand for two weeks with my mom. And in the past, I would have been like, no, like I'm training. I, you know, I can't like, like there's no time for that. I need to focus. And this time I was like, you know what? I, I can manage both. And I just need to be smart in how I come up, you know, how I, how I approach this. And so I think it's really about figuring out what's important. The running is important to me. And obviously I want to, you know, excel at Boston and do and have an amazing race, but not to the extent where I'm willing to sacrifice these other things. And in the past, I would have done that. So it's really about finding priorities and and I think fitting those priorities in. I think too, my self-care used to be like running only. And now I do, and in part too, because I think I'm in pain management. And so I, I see patients and I'm like, okay, balance is really important, right? especially when I talk to like a lot of my older patients who have been athletes in the past, but I do a lot more um, like real self-care, like, you know, meditation, breath work, ice plunge in that part has it, like yoga. Like I don't just run now or I say I used to like just run, but you know, I, I try to do um, a balance of stretching. And, and so I think that has helped me to develop a new relationship with running that is, that is, has a better fit in my life and is hopefully a better, like healthier way. And especially like, as you get older, it's just like the recovery is not as easy. Um, you know, when I was in my twenties, you can like go out, run 20 miles, come back the next day, run 20 miles. Like I just can't do that anymore. And so I have to be really smart, um, and listen to my body. And I've gotten a lot better at that in the last, um, like eight months as I've kind of re- re-engaged with this level of running. Kelly's first re-engagement with running, her return to more formal training, came just last year in 2023. I had a couple of friends. I had just, um, one of my neighbors was in a run group and it kind of invited me and like heard I, you know, was a runner or ran, I guess at that point. 
So he invited me to start running with them. And so I started running with this run group on uh, Saturday mornings. And a lot of them were training for the big bear uh, marathon and half marathon. And it was pretty close. I had just met them in September and I was running, but not like, again, very structured and not running um, quite that same volume. I was probably running, I don't know, 15 miles a week. And so they, within about a month, the marathon, the half marathon was in November. And um, I started running with them like right after Labor Day. So I started like just kind of slowly increasing my volume and um, they kept, you know, asking if I was running and I figured like, why not? It was a half marathon. I had been running half marathons, but maybe at like an 820 pace, like not very fast. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just showed up and it was this like brisk morning, which is like my, the perfect temperature for me. Um, one of the girls and I had kind of been running together through, for, during all of, a lot of our runs. And so we were kind of around the same pace and she, it was funny. We were both kind of shooting for like an eight minute pace. I'm like, yeah, that it's downhill. Sure. And so when that gun went off, I mean, she was like flew out the gate and I was like, okay, all right, I'll, I'll shoot for that. And so the next thing I know, I mean, we just kept pushing it and, um, I, and I felt, I felt good. And I just kept kind of hitting that like very fine line between, you know, too much and and not enough. Right. I just hit, I kind of found that threshold where I just felt like good, but I could keep going. And um, yeah, I ran what a one thirty one. Um, I didn't even look at my watch. I didn't look at my watch once. The, the first mile came through and I ran like a six forty two and I was like, oh, I'm going to die. And I kind of backed off just a hair, but then I didn't really look at my watch again. Um, and the fact that I like ran the first mile in like a 642, I was like, okay, or maybe even faster. I was like, okay, like this is interesting. <laughs> I've not been hitting these times. So I didn't think I could maintain it, but I just felt like, okay, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to see what, what happens. I had no expectations really. And I think that's what was kind of unique about it. To put this in some perspective, this finish was a 12-minute PR in the half marathon for Kelly. It also qualified her for the New York City Marathon. And just as a note, this is the last year that you can qualify for New York City with a fast half marathon time. Now, of course, Boston does not have the same qualifying option. You can only time qualify with a marathon. So a fast half marathon will not get you into the race. This performance did, however, earn Kelly an invitation to run as part of the professional para-athlete field. And so, Kelly Bruno will be lining up on March 15th in Hopkinton to run the Boston Marathon. And she will be doing that with a well-considered, fresh approach to the sport. I really enjoy running um currently i really enjoy my relationship with running and kind of the what it adds to my life right now and so it's been something i've thought about because i don't you know i i don't want to kind of fall into these almost bad habits of of um where i was where i felt like i was before um i really want to maintain that kind of almost distance from it where I enjoy it and I love it, but I don't have expectations from it. Right. That has been something that I've really been focusing on. And in the past I would, and I've had to be careful with it. Um, cause I actually hired a coach, um, for this race, which is the first time I've ever done that. I've actually never had a coach for any of my training. And one of the big things in even just like hiring a coach was like, I, didn't want, I don't want to be beholden to these workouts, right? I don't want, and and I definitely catch myself doing it where I feel like this anxiety, right? Before a workout, like, oh, what if I can't hit the times? What if I'm not good enough? Because that's that kind of cycle that I was in as an athlete in the past. And, and so I've been very careful in trying to separate myself from that identity, from that experience and just let it be. It is, you know, and and kind of let go of that expectation going into it. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons that Big Bear went as well as it did is I, I had no expectations. Every other race I went in with like, okay, I want to hit this time or I want to, you know, I've been training for this. And with Big Bear, I just kind of went into it being like, you know, I have barely trained for this. The weekend before I was in Death Valley and probably hiked and ran like twice the volume I usually do. I just kind of 
I, I just lived my life. And, and while I won't do that for Boston, I'm a little bit more, you know, aware that I need to be focused on um, both the training and uh, the event itself. I, I kind of want to take myself out of that expectation phase and just kind of let it unfold exactly as it's meant to unfold, um, which has been a lot of the work I've done in the last uh, few years. I will be very excited to cheer Kelly on as this event unfolds for her over the course between Hopkinton and Boston. And that does bring us to the end of Kelly Bruno's running story on the podcast. I want to thank Kelly so much for coming on the podcast and telling her story. And I know you, like me, will want to keep up with Kelly. And I will provide a link in the show notes of how you can do that. And as a reminder, you can come see Kelly Bruno in person along with Brie Bomer and Ari Hendricks at the live event that I am co-hosting with my friends Julie and Lisa of the Run Farther and Faster podcast. So please come join us on Sunday, April 14th at 2 p.m. on the live stage at the Expo. It is going to be a fantastic conversation I also wanted to mention that this is the first of several episodes that is focusing on athletes who will be lining up at this year's Boston Marathon. And a few of those athletes are women who are being highlighted by the Black Unicorn Marathoners. And this is an organization that celebrates and connects Black marathoners who are or have been in the Boston Marathon. And... The Black Unicorn Marathoners is hosting their 10th annual Celebrate and Connect event on Marathon Weekend on Saturday, that's April 13th, from 2 to 7 p.m. at the Reggie Lewis Track and Athletic Center. And you can learn more about that event at blackunicornmarathoners.org. And of course, I will provide a link to that in the show notes. And that does bring us to the end of this episode. Thank you so much for joining me here. I always appreciate you listening, and I would love it if you would rate and review the show wherever you listen. Thanks so much. And that's going to do it for me. I am Cherie Louise Turner. I am your host and producer. And until next Friday, I do wish you healthy, joyful, strong strides forward. Women's running, running, running. Women's running stories. Running should be simple. Just put on your shoes and go. And yet, when you try to learn about how to get better at it, especially as you age, you're confronted with conflicting advice, complicated workouts, and confusing nutrition trends that just won't work for you. On The Planted Runner, I'll share exactly how to run faster, longer, and feel great doing it at any age because you don't have time to waste. I'm Coach Claire Bartholik, and I went from not running at all in my late 30s to finishing a marathon in 258 at age 42, all on a plant-based diet. I've helped hundreds of runners achieve new personal records well into their 60s and even 70s with science back training, plant-based nutrition, and proven mental strength techniques. Each episode of The Planted Runner is like a private coaching session on the run where you'll learn from me and the guests I interview. You'll get actionable lessons to help you become a better runner every week and reach goals that you never thought possible. Whether you're training for your first 5K or your 50th marathon, take along the planted runner on your next run. Let me show you how your best running is still ahead of you.